What we have to do as instructors is distill this information to a point where it is useful to the learner. And then when it's useful, we need to build on that so they get a much better depth of understanding. So we capitalize on these rote dominant learners and architectures and give them what they need to know. And then we work to build their depth of understanding of that information. So they may have a thousand less facts than somebody who just walked out of a private pilotage knowledge test, but the facts they do know are the ones that are important for them in the airspace system, and they know it a whole lot better than most of the people who I see that come for examinations. This is the usual volume. Jerry talked about it, 400-something thousand words. This is our version of VFR regulations. We have 35 points that talk about Part 61, and I have 52 points that talk about Part 91. And I assure you, that is all you need to know about the regulations as a private pilot in the U.S. airspace system. The other thing we did with our information is we reorganized it. The problem with textbooks, here's a good sound bite for the media folks, Roger Sharp says the problem with textbooks is there are a lot of words. <laughs> Not only are there a lot of words, they have sentence structure like nouns and, and verbs and transitions and punctuation which is all great if you're writing poetry. But people do not learn technical information in sentences. They learn technical information by key thoughts. So why would we put a document with a page of information, like in most of the handbooks, that's .9 font, that requires the learner to pull out of that what the relevant points of fact are, why don't we just give them the relative points of fact up front so that because they are dying to commit something to memory, they commit those relative, relevant facts. We can then use that to build on their ability to apply that in real-time information. And by the way, I use 14 font for no particular reason whatsoever. The DFC-90 all-digital attitude-based autopilot delivers significant performance and safety improvements over previous generation systems. Its innovative flight envelope protection guards against autopilot-induced stalls, and the straight and level mode provides one-button recovery from unusual attitudes for an added measure of safety. Immensely popular within the Cirrus community, the DFC-90 is now being made available for a growing list of aircraft including Piper Matrix and Mirage, Cessna 182s, and Beach Bonanzas and Barons. Fly with confidence. Fly with DFC-90. This has led to 46 separate products that we began developing about four months ago that get the learner to have the information that they need to know in a way that they can understand it so that we can work on them applying it in real-time fashion. Some of that information are simple forms, but that form or formsmanship has particular function. It drives a behavior. So if we ask them to compute a particular piece of information like MinXL check speed on takeoff, and for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to fly jets may not even know what that is, we require them to compute how long their takeoff roll should be before they ever take off. And they put that down on this form and they take it out. And why do they do that? Because during their pre-takeoff briefing, which is in our checklist, they have to brief the takeoff emergency for a single engine airplane so that they know if they have gone X distance down the runway and they are not airborne, there's something wrong with the airplane. And their only, only available option is to abort. Will that save somebody's life in the future? Boy, I hope so. Will we ever measure that statistic? No. I'll be very happy that it's a, a statistic never measured. People say, who've come in, maybe sarcastically, well, you're teaching the test. And sarcastically, I answer, sure, we're teaching the test. And oh, by the way, when you as an instructor sign those endorsements in the person's logbook in the back of the 8710, you are verifying that you, in fact, went over the subject material that's required in the regulations, and they meet the standards required by the PTS, which is the test. So if you are not teaching the test, you're falsifying a government document. But that said, my sarcastic answer over, of course we're teaching the test, but much, much more. We're developing analytical skills. We're teaching them to do visually dominant maneuvering in the airplane. We are having them master tools in the airplane that they will use in the real world. And all to a greater depth of understanding. If they understand it more, it is my hope that they'll have better application when that information becomes really important to them in the middle of something going bad in the air. And lastly, but not leastly, of course, can simulation be better used for primary training? We're talking about primary training now. And the answer is, I had no idea. 
I was impressed with the Redbirds. I've been impressed with simulation in the military. I've been impressed with a lot of simulations. But like many instructors, I didn't really know what its place was in primary training. And the answer is very much so. We teach customers to land airplanes in the simulator. Now, for those heretics who aren't in the room, you know, put that on a sound bite and I'll get a lot of hate mail, which just means I change my email. That's fine. We teach people the psychomotor skills they need to be successful in the airplane before they ever get in the airplane, and that includes landing. That includes maneuvering the airplane visually. It significantly cuts down on the amount of time they need in the aircraft, and for those of you who are budget conscious, it significantly cuts down on the wear and tear of the airplane because by the time they get into the airplane, it's transition training. And aside from a few, hey, I locked the brakes on landing, we really haven't had any issues. We teach people visual dominance in the simulator. Because in the simulator, we can blank out all the screens for the first five, 10 hours, whatever we need to do. That's a test subject. How long does it take before the learner doesn't then start to use the magic display in front of them as their primary reference? That's certainly something we're studying. Right now, we do it until they're proficient visually, and we move them on and start adding the information they have on the PFD and then later the MFD in the, in the training program. This allows us to do transition training in the airplane, which means by the time they get to the airplane, in theory, they already know how to fly. And this is great for the learner because it allows their, their rate of learning to accelerate tremendously. But it does require the instructor, who is used to doing primary training in an aircraft, to rewire their thoughts that they are doing transition training because, because really, they have to treat that person as if they're already a certificated pilot and this is just a 172 transition. And while the information is probably the same, the way you approach that is very different. Again, rewiring the instructors. And of course, we can train emergencies that you couldn't do safely in the aircraft. And for those of you who have been to Sun and Fun in AOPA, you know, we wrote uh, 10 scenarios for safe to roll out at both of those places to talk about some advanced skills that people have. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what we can do to prepare people for emergencies using devices like the FMX. Because if you can dream it, we can program it and study it. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. There isn't a week that goes by that we don't have some kind of an aha moment. And sometimes it's a daily and sometimes it's an hourly. We're not, I'm not on the phone with one of our programmers going, hey, Jason, when are you coming down here next? I need you to change this. I need you to change that. What would it take to do this? What would it change to do that? <clears throat> Again, I had no idea how capable these devices were going to be. And I believe I've only scratched the surface. And I say that honestly and humbly. There is so much more that we can do. Now, our only obstacle to doing any of this has been the liveware in the system. It is very difficult to overcome instructor primacy. It is very difficult to rewire instructors who are used to a particular teaching methodology or a particular delivery method to use this effectively. They always backslide, which means my challenge is to make sure that we are delivering programs that do not require the instructor to be the dominant force that's driving this training. That's our challenge to make sure that we do it. You can get a lot of rationalization, you get a lot of defensive behavior. I hear a lot of the defensive behavior from customers that come up at trade shows and say, you know, I didn't like this program. I didn't like Parrot because it didn't do this. I don't like the FMX because it doesn't do that. I don't like the FMX because it doesn't simulate a 787 really well. You know, my, so my 787, you know, climbs at 650 feet per minute and yours only climbs at, you know, 590, who cares, honestly. What they're missing is, what was the tool designed to do and does it do it? Let's talk about simulated ATC. Well, I will talk about simulated ATC in just a little bit. <clears throat> but let me get back to the instructor. The personality that makes somebody successful as an instructor does not lend to them doing rote or repetition very well or very long. They do not do rote or repetition very well or very long. 
they are the person that goes looking for that monkey smoking a cigarette or find something shiny or they are distracted or they're on their iPad doing something other than using the iPad than it was designed for in the cockpit. Why? Because they are bored. So we can either continue to ride this dead horse and say, well, we're, you know, instructors are going to be there and do this. Or we can hire new people to ride the dead horse. Or we can go to the government and get new regulations that declare the horse not dead and therefore we have to continue to ride it. We can do all of those things or we can simply dismount and say there are some things that instructors do very well and there are some things that they don't do well and the things that they don't do well have to be replaced by devices that do it well.